Well, before we begin, I'd like to kneel in prayer and ask the Lord to be here in a special way for our next study. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for the message that we have heard already this morning. And Lord, again, we ask that you would be here in this place in full measure. We know that without the Holy Spirit working upon our hearts, all is in vain. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be here to move upon our hearts and minds that your truth would speak to us in a special way just now. Give me the words to speak. Help me to be lost from view and that you alone will be exalted. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. wanted to say a few things about the Protestant Reformation given that this is 2017 as you know 500 years since 1517 and it's really interesting how much there is that's being remarked about in the Christian community at large on this and it seems like the whole Christian world is um, shall we say, smitten with the ecumenical bug. <laughs> and not all, but most. And uh, it just seems like there's just a ecumenical fever that is seized, just grabbing hold of all Christianity today. Uh, there's this uh, idea that we must all get together. We must fulfill the prayer of Christ is, is a tragedy for Jesus that all the churches are divided and that we must come together and fulfill the prayer of Christ in John 17. In fact, I'm sure many of you have heard about the John 17 movement, which is right straight out of Vatican II. I fear that what we see going on at large within Protestantism today is a clear sign that we have forgotten what the Protestant Reformation was all about and what it was actually based upon, and that is the issue that I want to address this morning. So what happened 500 years ago? Well, there's a number of things, and of course we can look at things, you know, because history is punctuated with certain defining events. We have Luther's 95 propositions against the doctrine of indulgences nailed to the castle church at Wittenberg in 1517. We all know about that. And we know about Erasmus publishing his Greek and Latin version of the New Testament in 1516. We know about the Diet of Spires, the protest of the princes there of Germany. And of course, that's where we have the nomenclature today, the Protestant Reformation. And it was this event that was an event that really gave traction to the Protestant Reformation. It wasn't so much the thing of one man now, it was much larger than that. But before that, we had Lorenzo Valla. Maybe we don't, I'm not quite so familiar with this man. But he wrote the discourse on the forgery of the alleged donation of Constantine. <laughs> and um, his first edition of that appeared in 1517. And it was read by Erasmus and Luther. Now the prevailing concept that the Pope and the Church was infallible was obviously beginning to break up at that time because Lorenzo Valla showed the donation of Constantine to be the absolute fraud that it was. <laughs> but before Lorenzo Valla was John Wycliffe. We all know about him, known as the morning star of the Reformation. And his followers were known as Lollards. 
But did you know why they were called Lollards? But because the Lollards were followers of Lollard the Waldensian before they became followers of Wycliffe. And so we see the early Waldensian Protestant Reformation connection there. And there is many connections between the Waldenses and the Protestant Reformation there, reformers there. Uh, another event was where the reformers, you may recall, came over into the valley of Engrona. And the bottom line of that get-together between the Waldenses and the reformers was that the Waldenses would bring their ancient Bible manuscripts together produce a Bible in the French language for the French reformers, and we know that Bible to be the French Olivetan Bible today. It's also called the Robert Olivetan Bible. Robert Olivetan had his cousin John Wycliffe help him on that Bible. The second edition of that Bible became the basis for what we know today as the Geneva Bible. And, of course, the Geneva Bible was largely the basis for the King James Version of the Bible. So you can see that the King James Version does indeed, when you track it back, have a very strong Waldensian heritage to it. Now, as I said, while history is punctuated by certain defining events, history is more a process than an event. Um, defining events are interconnected with protracted developmental phases in between. And so often when we talk about history, we just more or less talk about s certain of these uh, defining events. Now the concept of protest and reform, of course, is a biblical principle that has been working all through recorded sacred history. We find it in the Old Testament, do we not? Moses threw down the newly written tables of the law in protest to the image worship of Israel. And then Moses labored to restore the people back to lives that were in harmony with God's will. The Lord through Moses says, Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments. You see, the basis of God's covenant with his a people is the commandments, statutes, and judgments, and the basis of all true reform is the law. If people deviate from law, whether it be divine or human, you're going to be in trouble. Now, God's blessings were promised on condition of obedience to his commandments, statutes, and judgments, as we have already studied and curses were promised as consequences of disobedience. But before the Lord would send curses, he would send messengers to protest the people's disobedience and seek their reform. God is merciful. The Old Testament says his mercies are new every day, doesn't it? He's a merciful God. And so when he finds his people deviating, he doesn't just blast them with full-fledged curses all at once. He, but he does try to get their attention and seek their reform. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven, to give rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. But the curse, the flip side of that is, if you don't obey him, you shall be the lend, uh, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him, and he shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Now this apply this to present tense reality in the United States of America today, and let's ask ourselves, where are we in this picture? Are we a net lender or a net borrower? So then... It naturally follows according to the word of the Lord that it's obvious why it is that this nation seems to be under a curse today, does it not? Amen. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all these commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, Isaiah protested, 
or maybe more accurately, we should say God protested through the prophet, saying, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show the people of their, their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? See, the basis of reform is the law of God. But where in Christendom do we hear this basis of reform today? The Lord protested through the prophet Jeremiah, for I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early, protesting, saying, Obey my voice. I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early, sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way and amend. And that word does mean there, reform your doings. The words I brought them up out of the land of Egypt are from the law of God. Yes, it's part of the Ten Commandments. We often don't think of that, do we? Where it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's part of the Decalogue. And when people deviate from the Decalogue, they're surely, as far as they take one step of deviating from the law of God, they are taking a step away from the Lord and going into bondage. Malachi protested, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should, should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Yes, that's right. The priest's lips should keep knowledge of God's law. But what is the situation today in Christendom in professed Protestant America? Not just America, of course, but we're Americans here. We're in the United States of America, so that's how I'm going to address it. All the nations of earth are in great state of perplexity at this time, and it's because of their deviation from the law of God. But ye are departed out of the way, you have caused many to stumble at the law. Wow, does that describe what's going on today, huh? Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. See, the priests were picking and choosing which of God's laws they would follow, and the people just followed them. The priests were to read the law, to the people every seven years, but they were to ever be a voice of God's law to the people in the intervening period. Now, a study of Nehemiah back in the day is very informative for us. And it should have been very instructive to the 16th century reformers, and it definitely ought to be instructive to us that how the Jews came out of Babylon, God was restoring them, restoring the covenant back to them, restoring their kingdom back to them. And yet in the midst of that work of reformation, there were the very things that were taking place that took them into Babylonian captivity in the first place. Nehemiah understood that without spiritual reformation, the building of the city walls was useless. He said, did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? And he was speaking to the fact that they were actually trampling the vintage, making their grape juice, bringing the crops into the city on the Sabbath. They were doing business with the merchants outside the city on the Sabbath. And Nehemiah was in reference to what Daniel says here. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the pre thy precepts and from thy judgments. 
neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. How easy it is to profess God and to actually do what he says. Oh, and then 490 years later, what's the condition of things? Here comes this lamentation from the lips of Jesus. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would have I gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. It's not that they could not, they would not. Jesus says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And after Jesus rose from the dead, what did he do? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that, he might, that they might understand the scriptures. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall, we believe, how shall ye believe my words? Paul did the same thing, as we have already discussed, bringing to the people the law and the prophets. Yet this is what Daniel said they had not done, had not hearkened unto God's servants, the prophets, and had not hearkened unto Moses. Isaiah the prophet was sawed in half. It was intended that Jeremiah die a very slow death in a mud pit. And Stephen said, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them? The scriptures give a picture of the Jews that is not flattering. Jesus himself said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And why all this endless hatred toward the prophets? It's a human condition. It's, it's ever been that way. Jesus wasn't hated by some foreign country. He was hated by his own. His own came unto, or he came unto his own, and his own received him not. It's because the prophets were instruments by which God protested and sought reform among his people, a reform from sin to sanctification. Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might, through him, might be saved. But this was their condemnation, that they loved their sins. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We have all this recorded we need to pray that it will somehow lodge and have uh, in our hearts and minds and um, actually make a difference in our lives. Oh, that it might not just be a profession, but it actually makes a difference. The cycles of protest and reform will come to an end. The time is very soon coming that the final protest will have been given and the final reform will have been accomplished. The prophets, both dead and living, will have borne their last testimony. And that, at that time, there will be only two classes, those who hearkened unto Moses and the prophets and those who didn't. And that's why God says, again, remember ye the law of Moses and Elijah the prophet. Our attention is being called to Moses and the prophets. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. In other words, the spirit of prophecy will be functioning to the very end, just like it was, has been all through sacred history, and even more so. 
Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The Apostle Paul warned, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, if there was to be no prophesyings at the end of time, what would have been in the need for that counsel? He just says, well, don't pay attention to anything prophetic. But we know that the spirit of prophecy will be functional at the end of time, to the very end. And we're told that the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. Isn't that amazing? After the disappointment of 1844, it was thought best in 1851 not to publish anything from the spirit of prophecy that an unbeliever might read to avoid prejudice. Elder James White explained in an extra of the Review and Herald, and I quote him here, But as many are prejudiced against the visions, we think best at present not to insert anything of the kind in the regular paper. We will therefore publish the visions themselves for the benefit of those that believe that God can fulfill his word and give visions in the last days. And you can see the reference for that there in the Advent Review Extra, July 21, 1851. Well, that's what they did. They did what was proposed there by James White and others. And as the Advent Review became silent on the visions, so God became silent on any further visions even to believers. The results of this silence of no visions was not at once perceived, but at the General Conference of 1855, held at, the battle, held at Battle Creek, commencing November 16, it was clear that all was not right. They sent something as a miss here. Leaders acknowledged that they had taken a course that was displeasing to God and had not appreciated the gifts that he had given to the church quotes, to encourage the desponding and fainting soul and to correct and reprove the erring. As a result of their confession, Ellen White was taken off in vision where she said, I saw the Spirit of the Lord has been dying away from the church. <laughs> that was 1855. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord had been quenched and had, in effect, the church had despised the prophesyings. Now, of course, we know they didn't despise the prophesyings, but the result was the same as if they did, wasn't it? The result was the same. And though that was done by well-meaning people. Quite a lesson for us, isn't it? The position that the Bible and the Bible alone is the rule of faith and duty does not, and by the way, James White then later said after that incident, the position that the Bible and the Bible alone is the rule of faith and duty does not shut out the gifts which God set in the church. To reject them is shutting out that part of the Bible which presents them. We say, let us have a whole Bible. And let that and that alone be our rule of faith and duty. Place the gifts where they belong, and all is in harmony. Of course, the Bible talks about the gifts, doesn't it? The gift of prophecy. Right, talks about it happening. Some things are going to happen that are going to be outside the Bible that are going to happen. Of course, we test them according to the Bible. But um, one lesson we can learn out of this, that the testimony of the prophets wasn't just for God's people, his denominated people, it was for the whole world, for believer and unbeliever. Was not the spirit of prophecy working through the prophet Daniel? Was not the prophet Daniel the spirit of prophecy of his day? Mm -hmm. And yet did he not uh, minister to his own people? Yet he also ministered to kings, didn't he?
Yeah, that's right. It gets back to the Bible. It always does. That's where it all began. In the beginning was the Word. It always gets back to the Bible. And see, that's where the Protestants got back to. They got back to the Word of God. They got back to its authority, its origin, its power, its trustworthiness, its preservation, its infallibility. But they were contending with great opposition. There came into bold relief. And there was two powers that were facing off. One Roman Catholic, the other Protestant, and it's exactly the same thing today. Now, Romanists and Protestants do not mean the same thing by Scripture, nor do they mean the same thing by infallibility. And their different use of the words is a most important part of the Reformation conception of Scripture. Now, we're going to go back and forth here contrasting the differences between Protestantism and Catholicism as it relates to our relationship with the Word of God. The Great Controversy says, there is the need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only is the rule of faith and duty. This is Catholicism. The Bible is not the sole and only rule of faith. So one position it is, the other position it isn't. The belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. Now, that's not Ted Schultz saying that and saying some terrible thing, you know, out of my biases about Catholicism. This is out of the Catholic Encyclopedia under the heading Protestantism. But my Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My Bible doesn't say that the Bible is fatal to faith. Protestantism, the principles contained in this celebrated protest, that is the protest of the princes of the 19th of April, 1529, constitute the very essence of Protestantism. Protestantism sets the power of the conscience above the magistrate and the authority of the word of God above the visible church. I took that straight out of de Aubigny's uh, book, uh, The Spirit, Spirit of Prophecy, Great Controversy, does quote some of this. I have the good fortune of having a set, of original set, of Merle de Aubigny's books. And uh, they're very meaningful to me. Catholicism. The Catholic Church is always in time as well as in degree before the Bible. Before the Bible. Now, of course, we have the statements above the Bible, but this statement says before the Bible. And they believe that. The scriptures are infallible according to Protestant, inf infallible according to Protestantism. Quotes the grand principle maintained by these later English reformers, the same that had been held by the Waldenses and by Wycliffe and by John Huss by Luther and Zwingli and those who united with them was the infallible authority of the Holy Scriptures as a rule of faith and practice. Amen. You know, these dear 16th century Protestant reformers, they had a lot to learn, didn't they? But it just amazes me how they were able to lay this basic principle down. And uh, the fact that they were able to do that, bear in mind, they were steeped in 1,200 years of darkness. And to be able to do this, we take this kind of position for granted, but if we put ourselves in their position, it's a phenomenal thing that they accomplished in a very short period of time. Catholicism, the church is infallible. Professing infallibility he, the Pope, claims the right to change the law of God to suit his own purposes. By so doing, he exalts himself above God and leaves the world to infer that God is fallible. Wycliffe now taught the distinctive doctrines of Protestantism, salvation through faith in Christ, and the sole infallibility of the Scriptures. 
And then Zwingli, he submitted himself to the Bible as the word of God, the only sufficient infallible rule. He saw that it must be its own interpreter. So if the scriptures is the sole infallible rule, the only infallible rule, then there cannot be another. The scriptures interpret themselves. And why is that? Because the scriptures are infallible. And only that which is infallible can infallibly interpret that which is infallible. <laughs> Therefore, the scriptures must interpret themselves. It is needful that that be done with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Catholicism, the church is infallible and above scriptures, therefore only the church can interpret scripture. Okay, so then, is that just us saying that? No, we go to their latest catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 889, in order to preserve the church in the purity of the faith handed on by the apostles, Christ, who is the truth, willed to confer on her a share of his own infallibility. To fulfill this service, Christ endowed the church's shepherds with a charism of infallibility in matters of faith and morals. Of course, all the while while we're reading this, we're saying, Scripture, please, Scripture, Scripture, book, chapter, and verse, please. And continuing on, the Roman pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office. And it was Pope John Paul II that signed his approval to this particular catechism in 1992. So that's from them, official statement, as official as it gets. So that's not what we're saying about them, that's what they're saying about themselves. The Bible as interpreted by the church and according to the unanimous consent of the fathers. This was the claim of the Catholic Church. This was the main issue of the Council of Trent, which was called especially to consider the questions that had been raised and forced upon the attention of Europe by the reformers. Now, in January 18, 1562, at the last session of the Council of Trent, there was this archbishop of Reggio who stood up, Gaspar del Faso by name, and submitted to them the idea that the tradition of the church is above the Bible. And he openly declared that tradition stood above Scripture. The authority of the church could therefore not be bound to the authority of Scriptures because the church had changed the Sabbath into Sunday, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. Yes, and they also disobeyed God in doing so. And then this statement, another official statement, we observe Sunday instead of, instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in A.D. 336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Now, I took that out of the 1913 third edition of Gehrman's Catechism, which received the apostolic blessing of Pope Pius X on January 25, 1910. Why did I do that? I did that, took it out of this one, because there are those that say, and even among Adventism, even years ago, that say, that try to disprove our position that it was Rome that changed the Sabbath from Sabbath to Sunday. And, of course, part of that claim is we claim that they did it at the Council of Laodicea. Uh, and one such person that was disputing this was a gentleman by the name of D.M. Canwright. Then we have the councils of Laodicea and Trent being reaffirmed at the Vatican Council of 1870, which states, it is a dogma divinely revealed that the Roman pontiff, when he speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in discharge of the office of pastor and doctor of all Christians by virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, 
he defines a doctrine regarding faith and morals to be held by the universal church by the divine assistance a, a promised to him by in blessed Peter is possessed of that infallibility that which the divine redeemer willed that his church should be endowed for defining doctrine regarding faith and morals and that therefore such definitions of the Roman pontiff are irreformable of themselves and not from the consent of the church. Well then, if it's irreformable, then that means there's no place for a, a pr Protestant reformer to have much influence, is there? Then it goes on, but if anyone which may God avert, presume to contradict this definition, let him be anathema, that is, banned, cursed, excommunicated. In other words, there is no place for protest or reform with Rome's positions on their infallibility. The Protestant Reformation's concept of biblical authority and the Catholic Church's concept of, the ch of church authority are exact opposites and are irreconcilably and diametrically opposed to each other. Now, if this is the case, why is Rome pushing for ecumenism? It would seem as though that would be a, a question that all the people that are smitten with the ecumenical bug may well want to ask themselves, especially if they're Protestant. But we have Christian churches together, the doctrinally pluralistic Bibles, creedalism, yes, creedalism. See, creedalism, that's Romish. It's an external authority outside the Bible. You remember the, the Protestant principle is the Bible defines itself. Creedalism, like the fundamentals has the 27 fundamentals, maybe. Hmm? Really? We say we have no creed, but we use it as a creed. Look at how the doctrinal book has been merged right into the church manual. You check that out. All the synoptic statements from our doctrinal book are in the church manual. If you have a uh, 2005 edition of the church manual read the uh, abbreviated form of the baptismal vows and have an eye opener there just do that sometime we say we don't have a creed but all per, virtually all of uh, Christendom today has a creed and what that is, that's the first step you see, get them used to a creed uh, get them used to an eye the concept and the idea of an authority outside of Scripture that interprets Scripture. And then what happens? Well, the next step is to join in a universal creed. Anyway, then we have theological convergence. We have dialogue. We have the John 17 movement. We have the common Bibles and countless other ecumenical endeavors going on. Now we come to the Vatican II Council, Ecumenical Council of the 1960s. And out of that, and I'm extracting this from the documents of Vatican II, it says, for all of what has been said about the way of interpreting Scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the church, which carries out the divine commission and ministry of guarding and interpreting the word of God. In order to preserve the church in the purity and faith handed on by the apostles, Christ, who is the truth, willed to confer on her a share of his own infallibility. The Roman pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, and enjoys this infallibility in virtue of his office, when as supreme pastor and teacher of all the faithful who confirms his brethren in the faith, he proclaims by a definitive act a doctrine pertaining to faith and morals, the infallibility promised to the church is also present in the body of the bishops. When together with Peter's successor, they exercise the supreme magisterium 
above all and in all above all in an ecumenical council the catechism of the catholic church which i pope john paul approved june 25 1992 last and the publication of which i today order by virtue of my apostolic authority is a statement of the church's faith of catholic doctrine and attested to or illuminated by the sacred scripture the apostolic tradition and the church's magisterium it is meant to support ecumenical efforts that are moved by the holy desire for the unity of all christians showing carefully the content and wondrous harmony of the catholic faith now we will be getting back i'm going to address this again this statement there's another statement right in direct connection with this one that we will be addressing in a future study Ecumenum, ecumenism or ecumenism is the exact opposite of the three angels messages it is Satan's effort to silence the very messages that prepare the world for the time of the end and the second coming of Jesus. It silences the call to come out of Babylon. It reverses the call to come out of Babylon, to go in unto Babylon, in fact. Now, God has set us as watchmen. And in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers to them has been entrusted the last warning to a perishing world the proclamation of the first second and third angels messages there is no other work of so great importance they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention and I invite you to go on to your smartphones and on your computers and get on the internet and look at Great Controversy, page 606, on this very point here of what is the work of God's people right at the end of time. That's Great Controversy, page 606. Now, we have been warned. We are in danger of becoming a sister to fallen Babylon. That's not particularly hard to believe these days of allowing our churches to become corrupted and filled with every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And shall we be clear unless we make decided movements to cure the existing evil? Now that's manuscript 449. If you go to the published volumes, at least when I did in mine, again, this manuscript is missing. Number 448 is there, and number 450 is there, but the multi-page manuscript 449 that has this statement is missing. So, I, the reason I have this manuscript is because I retrieved this manuscript from the vault, personally, myself, at the White Estate, at uh, Loma Linda, and that's how I happened to have this manuscript. I did this back in 1980. And um, so I know that manuscript's there, or it was at one time. <laughs> but uh, this is a dire warning to God's people. I think our people are in terrible need of understanding uh, how easy it is for this to happen to us as a people. And in fact, it is happening as we speak. So, the work of protest and reform will go on. And where it goes on is where it has always gone on. It'll go on within the body of Christ. And yes, it will happen at the grassroots. Uh, we're told uh, in the end of time, few great men will be involved. And I, I want to be involved. I want to be faithful to God. And um, so here I am. I'm just a, really, I'm a nobody from nowhere. And I, I, I've um, just viewed myself repeatedly that when God's done with me, he can just take me over there and deposit me in the weeds and be done with the likes of me. But I want to be faithful to God and be his mouthpiece because we need voices that are 
voices for God. Uh, th this business of mumsing the word and not standing up for the Lord and standing in the gap and have a message of warning for God's people today. Those days are past. And uh, we each have our sphere of influence in which we move. And we each may, uh, the size of the sphere of influence that each one of us has varies largely. But we each do have our sphere of influence. And we need to understand, and then we need to tell forth and give the message, the messages that God has given to us for this time. And I pray that that will be the case and that God will give us the um, moral, the spiritual spine to do what needs to be done at this time is my prayer. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truths. Lord, help us to take your word and hide it in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. We know you're in the business of cleansing a people, and we want to be that people. Help us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name.